from Joseph Jacob's book of Celtic fairy tales, The Lad with the Goatskin. Long ago, a poor widow woman lived down near the Iron Forge, by Enniscorth, and she was so poor that she had no clothes to put on her son. So she used to fix him up in the ash hole near the fire and pile the warm ashes about him, and according as he grew up, she sunk the pit deeper. At last, by hook or by crook, she got a goat skin and fastened it around his waist, and he felt quite grand and took to walking down the street. So says she to him the next morning, Tom, you thief, you've never done any good yet, and you're six foot high and past nineteen. Take that rope and bring me a faggot from the wood. Never say twice, mother, says Tom. Here goes. When he had gathered and tied, what should come up but a big giant, nine foot high, and made a lick of a club at him. Well become Tom, he jumped to one side and picked up a rampike, and the first crack he gave the big fellow, he made him kiss the clod. If you ever have a prayer, says Tom, now's the time to say it, before I make fragments of you. I have no prayers, says the giant, but if you spare my life, I'll give you that club, and so long as you keep from sin, you'll win every battle you ever fight with it. Tom made no bones about letting him off, and as soon as he'd got the club in his hands, he sat down on the Bresner and gave it a tap with the capine and says, Faggot, I had great trouble gathering you, and you run the risk of my life for you. The least you can do is to carry me home. And sure enough, the wind of the word was all it wanted. It went off through the wood, groaning and crackling till it came to the widow's door. Well, when all the sticks were burnt, Tom was sent off again to pick more. And this time he had to fight with a giant that had two heads on him. Tom had a little more trouble with him, that's all. And all the prayers he said was to give Tom a fife that nobody could help dancing to when he was playing it. Begonis, he made the big faggot dance home and with himself sitting on it. The next giant was a beautiful boy with three heads on him and had neither prayers nor cashes and no more than the others. So he gave Tom a bottle of green ointment that wouldn't let you be burnt nor scalded nor wounded. And now, says he, there's no more of us. You may come and gather sticks here till a little lunacy day in harvest, with a giant or fairy man to disturb you. Well now, Tom was prouder than ten peacocks, and used to take a walk down the uh, street in the heel of the evening. But some of the little boys had no more manners than if they were Dublin Jackeens and put their tongues out at Tom's club and Tom's goatskin. He didn't like that. But it would be mean to give one of them a clout. At last, what should come through town but a kind of bellman? Only, it was a big bugle he had, and a huntsman's cap on his head, and a kind of painted shirt. So this... He wasn't a bellman, and I don't know what to call him. Bugleman, maybe, proclaimed the King of Dublin's door to was so melancholy that she didn't give a laugh for seven years, and that her father would grant her in marriage to whoever could make her laugh three times. That's the thing for me to try, says Tom, and so, without burning any more daylight, he kissed his mother, curled his club at the little boys, and set off along the yellow hide road to the town of Dublin. At last, Tom came to one of the city gates, and the guards laughed and cursed at him, instead of letting him in. Tom stood it all for a little time, but at last one of them, out of fun, as he said, drove his bayonet half an inch or so into his side. Tom done nothing but take the fellow by the scruff of the neck and the waistband of his corduroys and fling him into the canal. Some run to pull the fellow out and others to let manners into the vulgarian with their swords and daggers. But a tap from his club sent them headlong into the moat or down onto the stones, and they were soon begging him to stay his hands. So at last one of them was glad enough to show Tom the way to the palace yard, and there was the king and the queen and the princess in a gallery looking at all sorts of wrestling and sword playing and long dances and mumming, all to please the princess, but not a smile came over her handsome face. Well, they all stopped when they seen this young giant, with his boy's face and long black hair, and his short curly beard, for well, his poor mother couldn't afford to buy razors, and his great strong arms and bare legs and no covering but the goatskin that reached from his waist to his knees. But an envious wizened bitter fellow with a red head, and wished to be married to the princess, and didn't like how she opened her eyes at Tom, came forward, and asked his business very snappishly. My business, says Tom, says he, 
is to make the beautiful princess, God bless her, laugh three times. Do you see all those merry fellows and skilful swordsmen? says the other. I have to eat you up with a grain of salt, and not a mother's soul of them has ever got a laugh from her these seven years. So the fellows gathered around Tom, and the bad man aggravated him till he told them he didn't care a pinch of snuff for the whole billing lot of them. Let them come on six at a time and try what they could do. The king, who was too far off to hear what they were saying, asked what did the stranger want. He wants, says the red-head fellow, to make hairs of your best men. Oh, says the king, if that's the way, let them, one of them get turned out and try his metal. So one stood forward with sword, with sword and pot lid and made a cut at Tom. He struck the fellow's elbow with the club and up and over their heads flew the sword and down went the owner of it onto the gravel from the thump he got on the helmet. Another took his place and another and another and then half a dozen at once and Tom sent swords and helmets, shields and bodies rolling over and over and themselves bawling that they were kilt and disabled and damaged and rubbing their poor elbows and hips and limping away. Tom contrived not to kill anyone, and the princess was so amused that she let out a great sweet laugh that was heard all over the yard. King of Dublin, says Tom, I've quarter of your daughter. And the king didn't know whether he was glad or sorry, and all the blood in the princess's heart had run into her cheeks. So there was no more fighting that day, and Tom was invited to dine with the royal family. Next day, Redhead told Tom of a wolf the size of a yearling heifer that used to be serenading around the walls and eating people and cattle, and said what a pleasure it would give the king to have it killed. With all my heart, says Tom, send the Jackeen to show me where he lives, and we'll see how he behaves to a stranger. The princess was not well pleased, for Tom looked a different person with fine clothes and a nice green burda over his long curly hair, and besides, he'd got one laugh out of her. However, the king gave his consent, and in an hour and a half the horrible wolf was walking into the palace yard, and Tom a step or two behind, with his club on his shoulder just as a shepherd would be walking after a pet lamb. The king and queen and princess were safe up in their gallery, but the officers and people of the court that were patrolling around the great barn, when they saw the big beast come in, gave themselves up and began to make for doors and gates, and the wolf licked his chops as if he was saying, wouldn't enjoy, I enjoy a breakfast of a couple of years. The king shouted out, Oh Tom, with the goat skin, take away that terrible wolf, and you must have all my daughter. But Tom didn't mind him a bit. He pulled out his flute and began to play like vengeance, and Dickens a man or boy in the yard but began shoveling away heel and toe, and the wolf himself was obliged to get on his hind legs and dance, Tatha Jack Walsh, Tatha Jack Walsh, Tatha Jack Walsh, along with the rest. A good deal of the people got inside and shut the doors, not where the hairy fellow wouldn't pin them, but Tom kept playing and the outsiders kept dancing and shouting, and the wolf kept dancing and roaring with the pain in his legs were giving him, and all the time he had his eyes on Redhead, who was shut out along with the rest. Wherever Redhead went, the wolf followed, and kept one eye on him and the other on Tom to see if he would give him leave to eat him. But Tom shook his head and never stopped the tune, and Redhead never stopped dancing and bawling, and the wolf dancing and roaring, one leg up and the other down, and he ready to drop out of his standing from fair tiresomeness. When the princess seen that there was no fear of anyone being killed, she was so diverted by the stew that Redhead was in that she gave another great laugh, and well became Tom out as he cried, King of Dublin, I'll have two halves of your daughter. Oh, halves and all, says the king. Put away that devil of a wolf and we'll see about that. So Tom put his flute in his pocket and says he to the beast that was still sitting on his carabo ready to faint. Walk up to the mountains, my fine fellow, and live like a respectable beast. And if I ever find you come within seven miles of any town, I'll... He said no more, but spit into his fist and gave a flourish of his club. It was all the poor devil of a wolf wanted. He put his tail between his legs and took to his pumps without looking at man or mortal, and neither sun, moon or stars ever saw him in sight of Dublin again. At dinner, everyone laughed but the foxy fellow, and sure enough he was laying out how he would settle poor Tom the next day. Well, to be sure, says he, King of Dublin, you are in luck. There's the Danes moidrinus to no end. Juice run to luck with them. 
and if anyone can save us from them, it's this gentleman with the goat skin. There's a flail hanging on the collar beam in hell, and neither day nor devil can stand before it. So, says Tom to the king, will you let me have the other heart of my princess if I bring you the flail? No, no, says the princess. I'd rather never be your wife than see you in that danger. But Redhead whispered and nudged Tom about how shabby it would look to renegade on the adventure. So he asked which way was to go and Redhead directed him. Well, he travelled and travelled till he came in sight of the walls of hell. And, bedad, before he knocked at the gate, he rubbed himself over with the greenish ointment. When he knocked, a hundred little imps popped out their heads through the bars and asked him what he wanted. I want to speak with the big devil of all, says Tom. Open the gate! It wasn't long till the gate was thrown open and the old boy received Tom with bows and scrapes and asked his business. My business isn't much, says Tom. I only came for the loan of that flail I see hanging on the collar beam, for the King of Dublin is to give a thrashing to the Danes. Well, says the other, the Danes is much better customers to me, but since you walk so far, I won't refuse. Hand that flail, says he to a young imp, and then he winked the far off eye at the same time. So, Whilst some were barring the gates, the young devil climbed up and took down the flail that had the hand staff and Balthine both made out of red hot iron. The, the little vagabond was grinning to think how it would burn the hands of Tom, but the dickens a burn it made on him, no more nor than if it was a good oak sapling. Thank ye, says Tom. Now if you'd like to open the gate for a body, I'll give you no more trouble. Oh, tramp, says old Nick, is that the way? It is easier getting inside them gates than getting out again. Take that tool from him and give him a dose of the oil of the stirrup. So one fellow put out his claws to seize on the flail, but Tom gave him such a welt of it on the side of his head that it broke off one of his horns and made him roar like the devil he was. Well, they rushed at Tom, but he gave them little and big such a thrashing that they didn't forget for a while. And last says the old thief of all, rubbing his elbow, Let the fool out, and woe to whoever lets him in again, great or small. So out marched Tom and away with him, without minding the shouting and cursing they kept up at him from the tops of the walls. And when he got home to that big barn of a palace, there was never such a running and a racing as to see himself and the flail. When he had, there, when he had his story told, he lay down the flail on the stone steps and bid no one for their lives to touch it. If the king and queen and princess made much of him before, they made ten times more of him now. But Redhead, the mean scruffhound, stole over and thought to catch hold of the flail and to make end of him. His fingers hardly touched it when he let out a roar to the, as if the heavens and earth were coming together and kept flinging his arms about and dancing that it was pitiful to look at him. Tom ran at him as soon as he could rise, caught his hands between his own two and rubbed them this way and that, and the burning pain left them before you could reckon one. Well, the poor fellow between the pain that was only just gone and the comfort that he had in, had the comicless face that you had ever seen. It was such a mixerium gatherum of laughing and crying. Everyone burst out laughing. The princess could not stop no more than the rest. And says Tom, no ma'am, if there were fifty hops of you, I'd hope you'd give me them all. Well, the princess looked at her father, and by my word, she came over to Tom, and she put her two delicate hands into his rough ones, and I wish it was myself in his shoes that day. Tom would not bring the flail into the palace. You may be sure that no other body went near it. And when the early risers were passing the next morning, they found two long clefts in the stone where it was after burning itself and opening downwards. Nobody could tell how far, but a messenger came in at noon, and they said the Danes were so frightened when they heard of the flail coming into Dublin that they got into their ships and sailed away. Well, I suppose before they were married, Tom got some man like Pat Mara of Tom and Neen to learn him the principles of politeness, fluxions, gunnery and fortification, decimal fractions, practice and the rule of three direct the way he'd be able to keep up conversation with the royal family. Wherever he lost his time learning them sciences, I'm not sure, but it's the surest fate that his mother never saw him, never saw any want.
until the end of her days. The end.